You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Rosh Hashanah Prep. Uh, this is one of my favorite times of the year. I love Rosh Hashanah, and I love Rosh Hashanah because it is a time for new beginnings. It's a time for new beginnings, and it's such a powerful time, Rosh Hashanah, when we can influence so much that we feel is, oh, that's beyond my ability, that's beyond my my reach. It's not beyond your reach. Rosh Hashanah is very, very accessible, and it's something which is really a tremendous, tremendous gift. So we're going to talk about five or six different topics tonight. We're going to start with Elul, which is the month preceding Rosh Hashanah. Then we're going to talk about beginnings, the importance about beginnings. We're going to talk about Simanim, which is the different signs that we have, like the dipping the apple in the honey and all of, all of the different uh, special pieces of the Rosh Hashanah dinner. We're going to talk about Rosh Hashanah itself being a day of judgment, a day of personal responsibility. We're going to talk about the shofar. And now we're going to talk about repentance. We're going to talk about prayer. There's a lot to talk about. So we're going to pack it all in. All right, so let's jump right in. What is Elul? Our sages tell us that these days, the month of Elul, the 30 days preceding Rosh Hashanah, the 40 days preceding Yom Kippur, are called Yimei Ratzon, days of Hashem's desire for our closeness. These are the days that Hashem wants us. Hashem is yearning for a relationship. Our sages call it a parable of Hamelech Basadeh. The king wants to connect with his constituents, so he goes out into the marketplace. He goes out into the field. He goes to meet the people, so to speak. God is accessible. God is accessible during these days like he isn't accessible the entire year. It's really a phenomenal time for us to really access unbelievable potential in our relationship with God. One of the great examples that I've always tried to live close with is when I was about 14, 15 years old, I was living in New York City, and there was a new mayor, and his name was Mayor Rudy Giuliani. He had to clean up a big mess because they had about 10 or 15 years where they'd give out parking tickets, they'd give out traffic tickets, they'd give out all these different summonses, and they never collected any of them. So if you got a bill, you knew you didn't have to pay it because they'll never come after you. There's too many people to run after, they're not going to run after you. And here a new mayor comes in who's serious business, and he's like, hey, we have bills to pay, and we're not, we're defaulting on all of our bills. And we have billions and billions of dollars (laughs) that are just sitting there and waiting for us to take that money. So he created a program called Amnesty for Parking. And it was all over the radio. It was all over the television. It was all over the billboards. Everywhere you looked in New York City, you saw Amnesty for Parking. And that was you had 30 days. If within those 30 days you paid the original bill, then no points, no nothing. Just pay the fine and that was it. If not... Then we come after you with all of the interest and all of the administrative fees, and we're going to we're going to come after you. Billions of dollars flooded into New York City because there was amnesty. You have an opportunity where we're not going to charge you any penalties. Just pay the fee, pay the bill, and then you're good to go. And this is a time on Rosh Hashanah where Hashem says amnesty. Amnesty, whatever you want. Let's just let's just close the deal together. It's almost think of it like this. It's like imagine there's a couple who has a rocky relationship. So do you say, you know, forget it, I'm just throwing it out? Or do you say, no, you know, let's just try something. Let's just try anything. Let's try to make it work. And that's our uh opportunity on Rosh Hashanah is to make our relationship with God work. Make the relationship work. We have amnesty where Hashem opens up the doors and Hashem says, guess what, guys? Whatever you want, I'm ready to sign a deal with you. Why would Hashem do that to us? Because Hashem wants us to be close to Him. Hashem loves us and He wants us as close as possible. 
the relationship we have with God is not a relationship where many think, like, God is going to strike me and God is going to hurt me. No, God loves us. He gives us life every day because he believes in us. He's our biggest investor. The greatest investor you will ever meet in you is God. God put you on this earth today because he thinks you can do something great today. We say that every morning. We declare this every morning when we say, Rabba emunatecha. Rabba emunatecha. Great is your belief in me. God, you believe in me. That's why you gave me another day. You gave me another chance. You gave me another opportunity. So that is Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is a time to connect. It's a new opportunity to connect. You know, the shofar that we blow throughout the month of Elul is a time to wake up. There's amnesty. It's 30 days. Be careful, right? The clock is ticking. You have this opportunity. Utilize this opportunity. And that's why we try to be our best. The Rosh Hashanah, there are, we're going to talk about this more, but there are people who do many interesting customs on Rosh Hashanah. Oh, so you're trying to fake who you are? You're trying to be someone who you're not? Yes. We're trying to act in our best behavior. We're going to fake it till we make it. Rosh Hashanah is that time where we say, yes, indeed, that's what I'm striving to be. Even though I'm not there yet, I'm going to try. I'm going to put my effort forward. We're not fooling God. We're not fooling God. We're not fooling ourselves either. We're trying our best. And like we said, that couple who has a rocky relationship, you say, I'm, I'm not going to try to be the best husband because I, who am I fooling? Good. At least try. Put forward an effort. Make believe. Because you know what happens when you try a little bit? It starts the cycle of things moving in the right direction. You just try a little bit, a little bit, and it, it transforms who we are. The first letters, Ani Lidodi Vidodi Li, is Elul, the month of Elul. Ani, the Aleph, Lidodi, Lamed, Vidodi, my beloved is to me. I am to my beloved, my beloved is to me. It's great marriage advice. You be for your beloved, and hopefully your beloved will be for you. But your, your step, you gotta take that first step. I am for my beloved. That's the first step. If they're gonna be re- reciprocal, that's a, that's, that's a hope. That's a prayer. With all, the Almighty, it always is, by the way. With the Almighty, it always is reciprocal. So let's see a little bit. We talk about this being a, an opportune time to connect to God. It's a time to prepare. Anybody who's ever been on, on the stand, on the witness stand, or you've had a, a trial, you know you take time to prepare. You talk to your attorney. You plan out what's going to be the strategy. What am I going to say? Am I going to plead? Am I going to plead? Am I not? What are, what are we going to do? These 30 days preceding Rosh Hashanah is a time to prepare. It's a time to say, I'm taking this seriously. Because there's not no worry. Hashem wants us to succeed. That's the amazing thing. Hashem is the judge. He wants us to succeed. Give me something. Like, give work with me here. Right? Work with me. We have to prepare for a new beginning. Something totally new. We're starting a new leaf. And that's one of the reasons it's my favorite time of the year. It's a new beginning. Start all over again. You made mistakes. Guess what? We all make mistakes. Moses sinned. All of our ancestors sinned. They all made m- mistakes. So, doesn't mean anything. Uh, is there any man out there who can say that they never made any mistakes in their relationship? Any man? Show me. Right? Oh, no hands. Right? And yet the relationship isn't over. No, we still desire that relationship. Even if we made mistakes. Because, here's the amazing thing. A relationship that has no fights is a relationship that has no love. What? It's the craziest statement, Rabbi. How can you say that? Well, here's the thing. A fight doesn't mean that you hate each other. A fight means that there's a new opportunity for closeness. It's a new opportunity for closeness. I had a friend of mine who got divorced, sadly. After three years, he was married, got divorced. So we had dinner together once, and I said, if you don't mind me asking, did you guys fight a lot in those three years? 
He says, I know this might surprise you. We never fought. Not once. You know what? If you don't have a relationship, there's nothing to fight about. When you have a relationship, that's when things don't, you see things in a different way, you like different things, you have different, that is the greatness of a relationship. You know why? Because what happens after a couple works through their differences, they become closer. You want to hear an amazing thing? I once fractured my shoulder, rounding second base. I was, it was a wet, a wet field. I slipped, I fractured my shoulder. And a few years later, I met a doctor and I said, you know, maybe check out my shoulder, make sure that it's all okay. You know, it's after I had uh, immobilized it for a long time and had x-rays, everything was healed, thank God. He said to me, I want to ask you a question. Do you feel that perhaps your left shoulder is stronger than your right shoulder? I said, why would that be? He says, because the body learns that if it broke once, I have to super glue it even more so that it won't break a second time. It gets even stronger. When you have a tear in a relationship, when the couple properly gets together and they resolve the, the differences, they become much stronger. Much stronger. That's the beauty of challenge. So now we may have a challenge with the Almighty. Uh-oh, God, you're looking at me. What, what did I do wrong? Guess what? It's an opportunity for that relationship to only excel and become greater. So Rosh Hashanah is a time to really shoot for the stars. Don't sell yourself short and just say, I'll, I'll come to synagogue and I'll hear the chauffeur and, and I'm out. I, did my, I paid my dues. It's not about the dues. It's about the connection. It's about feeling closeness with the Almighty, with your creator, with your investor. There's a story that uh, the Midrash talks about. There was a, a prison and a few of the inmates made a hole, and they had a prison break. They, they ran away. The guard hears the commotion. Everyone ran out, and he comes to the prison cell, and he sees there's one guy sitting there. See, he starts beating him. He says, you're beating me? Why are you beating me? Why are you beating me? I'm the only honest guy who stayed. He says, but you have an open door. Why didn't you run? God gives us an opening on Rosh Hashanah. He says, run, it's free, go, go, it's easy. Don't stay there and say, oh, I'm just content with where I'm at. We have the opportunity to be the greatest human beings on planet Earth, respectively, each in our own way. Go get them. Rosh Hashanah is that time to declare, yes, I'm going to step up my game. I'm going to accomplish greatness. We have 40 days between the beginning of Elul, the month of Elul, till Yom Kippur. What are these 40 days for? Why specifically 40 days? So if we look throughout the Torah, you'll find the numbers have great meaning. Seven, two, three, five, ten, eight, all numbers you'll see common themes between them. And the Maharal, the great commentator, has an unbelievable teaching for each of those numbers. The number 40 we see has a pattern as well. What's the number 40? We see that a baby, gestation, full, full-term gesta- gestation is 40 weeks. A fetus is considered a living being. It gets its first brain signals after 40 days. It's considered living. Noah and the great flood with the ark, right? it flooded for 40 days and 40 nights. The Jewish people were in the desert for 40 years. A mikvah, which is a ritual bath that removes impurity, is a quantity of water to make a kosher mikvah, is a, is a quantity of 40 sa'ah. We have these 40 days, but we also have a couple of very interesting things. We have Rabbi Akiva was 40 years old when he started his journey. We have the lashes that the, the Torah talks about as we give 40 Minus one. Like we don't know how to do math. Right? We do. We give, it's not 39 lashes. We give 40 minus one. And the same terminology is used for Shabbat. How many laws of Shabbat? We know the 39 laws of Shabbat. But it's called 40 minus one. Like we're mathematicians here. 
Right. 40 minus 1. What's the number 40? Why are we clinging to the number 40? Moses goes up to the mountain. He's there 40 days and 40 nights, comes back with the tablets. So we see this pattern of 40. Thank you. What is with this number 40? Sages tell us 40 means transformation. 40 means becoming a new creation. Anytime you see the number 40 in Judaism, it means making something anew. A baby, gestation, 40 weeks. Noah and the flood, what did God say? God says, I want to start this world over again. Start it over again. Uh-uh, it's number 40. The Jewish people in the desert, they were in Egypt for 210 years. They were slaves. They had slave mentality. You want to become a new people and inherit the land of Israel? You need 40 years. Sa'ah, in the mikvah, it needs a quantity of water that's 40 sa'ah. Why? Because someone goes in impure, comes out pure. You become a new person. You become a new person. You're talking about something new. It's 40. We have the lashes. The lashes are considered an atonement. So it, it removes the sin for that a person uh, performed. So the, say just say, even though it's 39, we call it 40 minus 1. To give you the idea that he's a new person now. Complete atonement has been granted. We have Shabbos is the same. Shabbos, we become a new elevated person on Shabbos. We have something called a Nishama Yitera, an elevated soul that's infused into us every Shabbat. You're a new person now. Not the same person you were during the weekday. A new person. It's 40. And Rabbi Akiva started a new life at the age of 40. We too are right now in those 40 days between the beginning of the month of Elul till Yom Kippur. A time to transform. And if you search on your Google, time for transformation, time for change, it'll pop up. 40 days, 40 days, 40 days. I checked it today. 40 days has a tremendous power to transform, which is why we try to utilize these special powerful days as a time for transformation as a time to change who we are. I'm not the same guy who did those mistakes. You come in front of the Almighty, he says, hey, why did you do that? You say, no, that wasn't me. I'm I'm a different person, right? I'm a different Alex, right? It's not me. It was a different guy. And we have that ability to really change. It's not a joke. We can really, really change who we are with small little steps. Small little steps. We make those changes. And here's the most amazing thing. We said, I am for my beloved and my beloved is for me. The first letters is Elul, the month of Elul. You know what the last letters are? Ani with a Yud, Lidodi with a Yud, Vidodi with a Yud, Li with a Yud. Those are four Yuds. Each Yud is 10. That equals 40. This is the time for absolute transformation. Isaac met Rebecca when he was 40 years old. He was ready to enter into into the canopy at the age of 40. Additionally, it was mentioned, if you didn't hear it online, uh, that Moses went, took him 40 days. He was on top of the mountain till he, in in the heavens, when he ascended the mountain, till he came down with the tablets, and then he went back 40 days later for another 40 days, and we'll talk about that soon. Beginnings are the most important. In fact, when the Torah tells us Bireshit in the beginning, it says Bishvil Yisrael Shenikru Reshit. God created the world for the Jewish people who are called the beginning. It's all about the beginning. What's so special about the beginning? So everything that follows the beginning is influenced. right? What's the most important part of a building? The foundation. If your foundation is not solid, the whole building is not solid. Everything is going to be challenged if you don't properly construct the foundation. We see our patriarchs, our matriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, were scrutinized because they were racist. They were the beginning 
of the Jewish people. When you're at the beginning, you're held accountable at a very high level. In fact, we, the children of Abraham, were punished because of one of his mistakes very severely. Okay, if you remember, when Abraham welcomed the guests into his home, so he says, here, I'm going to prepare bread, and I'm going to prepare, right, simple things, and then he brings them a whole cow, and he, he brings them all of these animals that he slaughtered for them. But if you remember, he asked someone, can you bring them the water? He didn't do it himself. Everything else he did himself, except for the water. The Midrash tells us, you didn't bring the water yourself. Guess what? Your children, when they're going to be in the desert, they're not either going to get water directly. They're going to have to get it through a conduit as well. Do it through Miriam's well. You're going to have to hit the rock. All of the different messengers that we're not going to get it directly. Why? For what? What's the big deal? Abraham, you should have done it yourself. Abraham, you should have given them directly yourself. You shouldn't have sent the messenger for that. You sent the messenger, your children are going to have to receive water from a messenger as well. Such a severe punishment, the Jewish people are complaining, they're crying, we don't have water, and then the waters were bitter in the desert. For what? Why do we have such a, you know, you know why? Because Abraham is the first Hebrew, he's the first, he's the beginning of a nation. When you're the beginning, everything is important. Every little move is important. There's an amazing Talmud in Tractate Ketubot 103b that says a story about Rabbi Chia. Rabbi Chia says that if there was no more Torah in the world, this is how I would restore the Torah. How would I do it? The first thing I'd do, I would plant flax, I would use the flax to make a net, I would trap a deer, I would use the meat of the deer to feed poor orphans, and then I would take the, the hide and make it into parchment and then use the parchment to write a Torah and to write the Mishnah. And I would get five students and teach them each one of the books of the Torah. I would get six students and teach them each one of the tractate, one of the sections of the Mishnah. And then I would have everyone teach what they learned and then everyone would know it and so on and so forth. Now, let me ask you a question. You can go to Dick's Sporting Goods and buy yourself a net. But you got to plant the flax. You can go to Academy Sports. You can go, oh, you pick your favorite. Go Amazon. You buy your net and you catch your deer. Or just buy the hide straight out and buy, buy the parchment and write a Torah. You go through a whole process. What Rabbi Chia is teaching us is that the beginning, the foundation, you know what, there shouldn't be any other motive the person who made that flag, who made that net, he probably wanted to make a profit. No ulterior motives. Pure for the sake... Why? You're restoring Torah to its majesty. You're restoring Torah to its greatness. It's got to be from the very beginning. It's got to be with absolute purity. We see the same idea that if they're building the temple, the tabernacle, we're building the temple. Third temple may be rebuilt Speedily in our days, amen. So you know what's going to happen? We're all going to get, a, you're going to have a big announcement here in Houston, right? As soon as Mashiach reveals himself and United Airlines, Southwest Airlines, everyone's going to say, hey, hey, Jews, let's go. Free trips to Israel. Let's go. Al on the on the eagle's wings, we'll fly and we go. We're all transported to Israel. Wow. It's going to be amazing. You know what's going to, you know what's going to happen? We're going to have to help out with the construction. We're going to have to help build the temple. Everybody. There's no exceptions. Oh, I got to run my business. No, 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 no. Close your business. We got to go. We got to put the, lay the bricks. Let's go on the temple. Everyone's going to go and build, except for the little children learning Torah. You're not allowed to disturb them. You know why? They're at the beginning stages. Beginnings are the most critical. They're laying the foundations for their life of Torah, those are the only people we don't interrupt. Even the elderly scholars, go lay bricks. Go help assemble the, 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 the you know, not the children. Not the children, because they're, they're at the beginning. The beginning is so critical. We see this many times. We see this with Noah. 
Noach, we mentioned previously the 40 days that there was the, 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 flo- the, 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 the rain, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Noach comes out of the ark after it subsided the water, took a long time for that as well. He comes out limping. What does he come out limping for? Because a lion bit him. A lion bit him. The Midrash tells us the lion bit him. Why did the lion bite him? Because he was late. He was late to feeding the lion. I mean, give the guy a break. I mean, for 160 days, either 160, 180 days till it subsided, after it rained for 40 days, we're talking about a half a year, this guy nonstop, Noach, is feeding every animal, giving them their foods, giving them everything that they needed. One time he's late for the lion and he, he bites his, his foot. What's the big deal? What's the message here? Because when you're the only lion for all of history, you're the future of all lions, you better not be late. Because if I'm dead, all the future lions are dead. The beginning is so critically important. You ever see someone with their shirt buttoned with the wrong buttons, right? What's the most important part of buttoning a shirt right? Get the first one right. You get the first one right, it's easier to get the rest right. That's what Rosh Hashanah is. Rosh Hashanah, let's get the first one right. We get that first button right. It's likely that the second day and the third day and the fourth day will all follow and be in order. You know, we say this about life in general. It's important. Beginnings are very important. You know, the beginning of marriage. The beginning of marriage is critically important. In fact, there are special laws in the Torah prescribed for a newlywed couple. First year of marriage, you can't go to war. I know you're righteous. I know you want to go and fight the battle. No, no, no. You have a responsibility. you got to be back home. And if you ask the rabbis, today's generation, the first year of marriage is really seven years. That's what the rabbis say. You treat your wife like a first year of marriage for seven years. And if you're smart, you'll do it forever. But what's about the end of the year? We're also at the end of the year. The ends are also critical. We say, hakol holech acharachisum. Everything goes by how you finish things. How do you finish things? You know, it's important, it's very interesting how people so appreciate the end of life. End of life. People ask forgiveness. People use it as a time to make amends. I've heard unbelievable stories how people on their deathbed, you know, called the sibling that they were in a lifelong feud with. And they, it was just a time to, to reconcile, make amends. It all goes after the end. You want to, you want to leave this world in, in, in a good way. People are very concerned about dying as a Jew. They want to make sure they're buried in a Jewish cemetery. I've heard this all the time. Rabbi, if I do this, can I be buried in a Jewish cemetery? If I do that, can I be buried in a Jewish cemetery? I've heard these questions a hundred times. What are people so concerned about dying like a Jew? We have to live like a Jew. Don't worry about dying like a Jew. If you live like a Jew, you have nothing to worry about how you die. But we see that the end of life is very important, but we see the end of everything is very important. We see when, when people conclude the, tra- the whole Talmud, make a huge, enormous party. When people finish a tractate, when we finish a book of the Torah, there's a big celebration. Chazak, chazak, v'nit chazek. We see, we pronounce it. It's, it's an important thing. We also have simcha Torah, which is when we finish the Torah, but also when we begin the Torah. Ends and beginnings are very, very powerful times. Because at the end, you want to make sure you do it right. So you're like, oh, maybe I made some mistakes. Let me fix this. But when you have an end and a beginning, like Rosh Hashanah, it's the end of a year. But we're not judged on the last year. This is an amazing thing. We're not judged on last year on Rosh Hashanah. That we do on Yom Kippur. And this is the beautiful blend between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. On Rosh Hashanah, we say, hey, God, you know what? This coming year is going to be amazing. This coming year is going to be amazing. Okay, no problem. I'll give you what you want. Now we have 10 days to prove it. Now we have 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We have 10 days to show how that transformation is real. How that transformation is something we're going to hopefully live by. 
And then on Yom Kippur, we say, please forgive us for what? For what we did before that Rosh Hashanah. For the mistakes we made prior. And this is how we're showing that we're indeed for real. When we're asking for something for the future, we really mean it. Simchas Torah as well is that, like we mentioned, is the blend of the end of the Torah and the beginning of the Torah. We finish the end of Deuteronomy and we start the beginning of Genesis. Again, we don't end. We start anew. We don't end. By the way, also death is not an end. It's an important thing to remember. Death is not the end of life. It's the beginning of a new life. The beginning of the next world. Right? And that the idea is of all of what we're talking about is that these are opportunities. It's an opportunity. It's a milestone. Rosh Hashanah is a milestone where we celebrate that God gave us a year. We say we're going to make next year even more special. And many times people think, Day of Judgment, Rosh Hashanah, I better be trembling, hiding under the table, in fear, white like a ghost, terrified. Oh my goodness, what's going to be? That's not what Rosh Hashanah is about. We see just the opposite. On Rosh Hashanah is a time of joy. On Rosh Hashanah, we bring out the fine wine and we, we, we wine and dine and we wear our fine clothes. Well, you don't do that when you're terrified. You do that when you're confident. You do that when you're happy. Well, you do that when you're feeling a connection. Rosh Hashanah is a microcosm of the entire year to come. The entire year to come is condensed into those two days of Rosh Hashanah. Our sages tell us, don't sleep on Rosh Hashanah. Don't sleep during the day. Don't take a nap. Why? You don't want to have a sleepy year. I'm sure you've heard that. Right? You've heard that. Don't sleep on Yom Many people have a custom not to sleep. It's not a sin. Many people say, no, no, no. I'm not going to sleep on Rosh Hashanah during the day. Why? So I shouldn't have a sleepy year. And now we understand why we have so many special omens, so many special, what we call simanim, signs, that we talk about at our meals. For example, we dip the apple in the honey. Why? So we should have a sweet new year. Why do we eat fish? We have a special. There are people, even if you don't like fish, you have a little piece of fish. So we should be fruitful, like fish are fruitful. Why we eat from a head of a lamb or a head of a fish also. Why? So that we should be like the head, not the tail. We should be leaders. We should be a good example. We eat from a pomegranate so that we should be filled like a pomegranate is filled and packed in with those seeds. We should be filled with mitzvos like a pomegranate. Uh, We eat carrots so that we should multiply our merits. And why? Because the word of... of, And and these are all... Some of them are just like funny, right? Like, what is... Carrots, it's called merin, means multiply in Yiddish. So people, people have that custom. They eat carrots so that we shall multiply our merits. There are people who do raisins and celery. So they should have a raisin salary. Huh? Right? right? <laughs> but there are also, you also have, uh, gourd. We should nullify all our, all evil decrees. So what's going on here? Like, you know, we're going to find a new thing and we're going to make a new, a new sign. Yeah. Exactly that. We're trying to show how great this year is going to be. We're going to fill it with sweet food. There are people who don't eat any bitter foods on Rosh Hashanah. Again, it's not a sin. It's a custom. There are people who don't eat any bitter foods. They won't, they won't have anything that's spicy. Why? You don't want to have a tough year. You don't want to have a spicy year in the sense of a negative spicy. Spicy good. Right? Spices with Torah. Yeah, that, that, that works. But not one that's bitter. Not bitter. We don't want to have a bitter year. There are many people who have a custom to fast from talking, from speech. Tanit dibur. They don't talk. Why? Because what happens when you talk? You talk too much. You start talking about nonsense. And suddenly you're talking about this, you're talking about that, and get into this. And Rosh Hashanah is a time where I want to be holy, I want to be pure, I want to show the greatest example of who I can be. And again, it's not faking it. It's not faking it. It really is what we're capable of, and that's what we're demonstrating. We are demonstrating on Rosh Hashanah 
the best version of ourselves. Yeah, you know what, God, forgive me. I wasn't able to do that on, on December 12th. It wasn't a good day for me. I wasn't able to be the perfect person that I could be. But Rosh Hashanah is that time. And that's why it's so important that we're meeting here tonight, a week prior to Rosh Hashanah, because we have some time to prepare. We have to, some time to to just contemplate. I think, I think the most, you know, my rabbi used to tell me, he said, if you want to get into the frame of mind of Rosh Hashanah, walk down the hallways of a hospital. We realize suddenly how vulnerable we are. We realize suddenly how valuable life is. And put something into action. Something that we can change. It doesn't need to be something big. We think that, oh, it has to be something major. I have to change my life. That means changing everything. Right? Anybody here try to do a diet overnight? Lose 20 pounds by tomorrow? It doesn't work. It's a long process of changing habits. Small. We talked about this many times in our Muslim Masterclass. Small little changes by one little tweak. You know what? One little change. I'm going to change how I, I'm going to think about thanking the Almighty before I eat food. I had a woman who once told me, she says, Rabbi, since one of the classes we talked about, she says, every time before I eat, I say, Hashem, thank you for the food. She says, I don't know the right blessing. I don't know how to say it. Just say thank you. That's the proper way. And you know what? Not only before, after too. Thank you. Before you get up from the table. We don't know exactly. And by the way, you're fulfilling a biblical commandment every time you do that. So you don't know the right words to say. So Hashem says, Achalta, Yesavata, Uverachta. You ate, and you were filled, you were satiated, and you thanked. It's part of it. We have unbelievable potential on Rosh Hashanah. All we have to do is unleash it. So we talk about a day of judgment. Anybody who's been in a boardroom, I have a board, and I try to meet with my board regularly. And one of the things that I try to do every year is convince them that I'm worth keeping in the job. I present them, hey, look, this is, this is what I've, what I've done. Hopefully they'll say, yeah, we like the work you're doing. We'll give you another year. But who's our biggest investor? Our biggest investor is the Almighty. And we're having that boardroom meeting on Rosh Hashanah. In fact, our sages tell us that on Rosh Hashanah, you can feel a little twinkle in your heart. There's a, a certain moment on Rosh Hashanah. Every person has it as, has it as a di- at a different time where their neshama is being presented in that boardroom. And that's the time where the heavenly courts are judging us. It says, Kivne Marom, that we are like the sheep. You ever see how they count sheep? They put them, they, they come from, a, you know, let's say 400 sheep, but there's that one area where there's one sheep alone. And they count it one at a time. One, two, three. And they mark, some mark it at, at 10. They do mark it. Now they know how many, 20, 30, but one at a time. One at a time. They all come through one narrow area. We, it says, are like Kibne Marom. We're like those sheep being counted. Yeah, we're doing what everybody does. Well, we're just like everybody else. We're just, yeah, yeah, but there's a point where Hashem says, I want to talk to you face to face here. And where we can't get caught in with everybody else. We're like, I'm just doing what everybody does. Just normal run of the bell guy here. Well, why should I invest in you? It's a real question. What is the answer that we're going to present to the Almighty? Why should God invest more in me? He's giving me so many incredible resources. Think of the resources that God gives us. An example I like to share is I was once at an event at a weekend retreat and I saw a guy being rolled in before Shabbos with his wheelchair. He had a few oxygen tanks behind him. And then behind the wheelchair, 
There was a guy carrying in an entire crate filled with oxygen tanks. So that the entire weekend, this guy can have oxygen. He's a normal guy, just can't breathe on his own. His lungs don't, don't function properly. So he needs to be fed oxygen 24 hours a day. And it hit me like a lightning bolt. I never had to carry an oxygen tank on my back. God gave it to me free. Why? Why did I deserve to have millions of dollars of resources given to me? What would someone pay? What would someone pay to be able to see? What would someone pay to be able to see in color? What would someone pay to be able to hear again or to hear for the first time? What would someone pay to be able to walk? And all of the other incredible gifts to talk and to sing and to move our hands. My daughter spent the summer in a special camp for people with disabilities. And her student, so to speak, that she was assigned to is a normal girl like any other girl who went skiing with her family and was in an accident and is paralyzed. Waist down, paralyzed. That's it. Can never walk again. Do you know how much she would love to walk once again? To just walk on her own without needing a wheelchair, without needing crutches, without needing any assistance. Perfectly normal. Perfectly healthy in every other way. Oh, one little nerve. One little nerve. And we have that free. Free. So now we're standing in this boardroom, we're sitting in this boardroom with the Almighty. God says, tell me, why should I invest in you? And we have to give a good answer. You know why? Because I'm going to try. Ah, I like that. You got it. Another year. God, because look, the past 30 days, I've made a little bit of a change. God, I'm going to try something a little bit better. I'm going to try to change one little thing. You got it. What does God really want from us? What is the purpose of all of the holidays that we have? Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Simchat Torah, Hanukkah, Purim, Pesach, Shavuos, Lagba Omer, you name it. What is the purpose of all these holidays? One purpose, to be close to Hashem. That's it he wants. He doesn't want us to be robots eating matzah. He doesn't want us to be robots lighting menorahs. He doesn't want us to be robots listening to the shofar blowing. He wants us to be close to him. That's it he wants. Ani lido di vido di li. Is it us to Hashem and Hashem to us? Or is it the opposite? Ani lido di that Hashem is to us. And now we need to learn to reciprocate. Hashem is constantly... Given us, given us, what, whatever you want, no problem. You want a beautiful wife, here you go. You want a good job, here you go. Where, where, right? Whatever you want. And what are you doing back for the Almighty? It's a one-way relationship. Oh, we're sitting in the boardroom, we say, Hashem, not. I'm going to take small steps. I'm going to show you that it's not a one-way relationship. I'm going to start giving back. Why? It's not God doesn't need us. God wants us. He wants us. He wants the relationship with us. That's what God wants. The only way we can succeed on Rosh Hashanah is if we take personal responsibility. It is the only way we can succeed. Saying, oh, I'll just uh, show up with everybody. I'll have the red carpet event at my synagogue. And everyone's going to show up in their finest and, hey, how are you? How was your year? Great, great. I hope the rabbi has a nice sermon. I hope the guy who blows the chauffeur doesn't blow it. And I hope that, the, you know, the cantor sings nicely. Oh, so beautiful, right? What's about me? What's about my personal connection with God? It's very easy to get carried away with all of the commotion of everything that's going on, all the people we see, all the people we meet. It's such a nice reunion. It's great to have everybody together again. COVID, everyone was in their own places. So now we can all come to Shul on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. 
It's very easy to get carried away. And then we have the tunes. Oh, I, don't, I didn't like that song. I, I, and when I grew up, we sang a different song. Everyone has their things about Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur's. It's not important. It's only one thing that's important on Rosh Hashanah. Me and my relationship with God. So how do we build a relationship with God? God tells us, how is your relationship with people? How is your relationship with your spouse? How is your relationship with your children? One second, you're trying to build a relationship with me, creator of heaven and earth, and your relationship with your spouse is not great. You're trying to build a relationship with me, creator of heaven and earth, and the relationship with your children or your parents, God forbid, are not not perfect. Got to work on those. An amazing thing my grandfather writes in his book about this specific idea is that if you really want a good argument on Rosh Hashanah, become a person that the community needs. Become indispensable to the community. So if you're involved in assisting you know, with Meals on Wheels or uh, visiting the, the people at the old age home or, or helping an organization, doing some type of act of kindness. You know what happens? Now you're a person of the community. You're showing Hashem, look how selfless I am. Look how selfless. By the way, you can also say I'm a great husband because that's the most, that's the ultimate act of kindness is for a person to be dedicated properly to their spouse. Because the, the relationship between a husband and wife is a reflection of the relationship between man and God, mankind and God. And when a person understands their responsibility to emulate God, which means to be a giver, which means to be thoughtful, which means to be kind, which means to be magnanimous, that's what God is. And that's what God wants us to be. God says, just like I'm forgiving, you should be forgiving. Just like I'm kind, you should be kind. Just like I'm patient, you should be patient. So when we emulate God in our relationship, God says here, is we're, 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 we're connected here. We're one and the same, so to speak. God is the creator of heaven and earth. He has no limitations, no imperfections. We have imperfections, and that's what we're trying to fix through this lifetime. Personal responsibility. We have to take the time to acknowledge the things that we were gifted with, the gifts that we have, and be accountable for it. If we lived up to it, great. Could we have done better? (laughs) I'm better than the competition. That doesn't make you the best you. If you're a great composer and you just compose mediocre music because that's what sells, you'll be held accountable for it. I didn't make you great so that you be okay. I made you great so that you be great. If you're a great writer, if you're a great orator, if you're a great thinker, and you don't maximize those gifts, we're held accountable. In fact, the Talmud says, and we discussed this previously as well, that you will be held accountable if there are delicacies in this world, like the Swiss Alps, the Colorado Rockies, the geysers in, in Yellowstone National Park, the uh, Grand Teton, Niagara Falls. God's going to hold us accountable. You're going to say, wait a second, I gave you such a beautiful world. Why didn't you enjoy it? Why didn't you enjoy it? I gave it to you. Why did I put it there? Why did I put it there? I put it there for you to enjoy. Didn't enjoy it? Held accountable. So imagine our skills, our talents, our abilities that God gives us and we don't maximize them. God can hold us accountable. It's no different than the beautiful mountains. I gave you beautiful art. Why didn't you utilize it? I gave you the ability to be a great leader. Well, just be uh, humble. Oh, I gave you, I gave you special talents. Got to use it. That's our responsibility. And Rosh Hashanah, the rubber hits the road. On Rosh Hashanah, we stand at that table and the Almighty says, no, probably doesn't use those words. <laughs> so what have you done? We're going to stand in less than a week 
we're going to be standing in synagogue and we're going to be hearing the shofar. The shofar is very, very, very powerful. And wherever I go and every time I blow the shofar, I tell the people who've done it here many times at this class, stop before the shofar blows and take a minute to pray. Take a minute to repent. Take a minute to have that moment of clarity. Because the shofar, when the shofar is blown, it's like the, you're clicking send. You're clicking send. It's send on everything. It's send on our prayers. It's send on our friendships. It's, you're, you're putting together your package. This is your package to the Almighty, so to speak. And now we blow those hundred blows and it goes through all the channels, the heavenly channels, and it arrives at God's throne. Take a moment. There's no need to rush. Take a moment. There was a story that's told where one of the great sages, when they were about to blow the shofar, he was with the Talmud sitting at the corner and studying Talmud. He said, right now, right now you're studying. Right now you should be preparing for the shofar. He says, I had a problem with the, with what I was studying and it's not letting my mind rest because I need clarity. So I need to find the clarity so that now I can hear the shofar properly. We shouldn't have open, open files. We should be preparing ourselves. Preparing ourselves, we're clicking send. Today, sadly, many people, because we have uh, things like WhatsApp and text messaging, so people write and don't even think before they click send. But really, we should. My children ask me, some of you may know what this is, some of you may not know. He asked me why I'm blue checking them. You know, blue checking is if you look at someone's message and you don't respond right away, you're blue checking me, right? Because it turns blue, the checks turn blue when someone else looks at it. Right? Why are you blue checking me? I said, I'm not blue checking you. I'm thinking before I'm answering. <laughs> it's a sin today. You can't think. You can't think. But before we send to the Almighty our message, let's think. Let's contemplate. Let's ask. Ask. Be aggressive. Say, God, I need your help. I need your help because this year I really want to make it great. I really want to do big things. I know I've said it in the past, but I'm sincere about it. And you say, oh, guess what I asked for last year? And guess what I asked for the year before? And guess what I promised the year before? And I promised the year before. And if you look, you look at your past 20 years, what have you been asking? What have you been promising on Rosh Hashanah? Same thing. God is a dummy. God doesn't realize, one second, let me pull the file from last year. Let me see what he did last year. Same thing. It's not the same. You're a different person than you were last year. And that's why it's important for us to even make one slight change. One slight, something small, I'm going to do differently. One something. And it's not hypocritical to say that you're changing and becoming a better person. Well, I don't keep everything, so we all... Don't keep everything. I'm not a Kohen. I can't bring an offering. Never. I never will bring an offering. Ever. I don't keep everything. There. See? Even your rabbi doesn't keep everything. Some things are just not applicable. Some things, we're not there yet. But as long as we don't turn our back towards it and say, it's not for me, doors open. And God says, I'll take, I'll take one drop. I'll take one. It's interesting. You mentioned before about endings how important the end is. I remember when I was a child, there was a, a show of a painter. He had this, this Bob Ross big hair, and he'd, he'd make this painting, and it would be, it'd be like, you know, and he'd put a, you know, he'd have a, a nice frame of a house, and then suddenly he'd put the paintbrush into some one of the colors, and he'd throw it right across the middle. And you're like, what did, what did you just do? What did you just do? Why did you ruin the beautiful picture you were in the middle of painting? Wait. Wait till the end. He's about to show you something new, something different that he's adding to it. But you have to wait till the end. And sometimes we don't see the full picture. We don't see the full picture. And even right now, we'll be at Rosh Hashanah. We would invite my grandfather to an event or whatever it was. He would be invited to a wedding after uh, Sukkot. And he would never reply till after... Yom Kippur. He wouldn't reply till after Yom Kippur. Unless, why not? You know you're going. 
He says, if God gives me life, I'll go. It's not a given. It's not a given. If God gives me life, I'll go. I'm not going to make a commitment now not knowing if God is going to give me life on Rosh Hashanah. Right? We assume, I woke up yesterday, I woke up today, I'll wake up tomorrow. Rosh Hashanah is a time where it's like everything's on the table. We're coming and we're having this, this day of judgment. So now, I'm going to say, Rabbi, it's a really frightening idea. No. Don't forget what we said in the beginning. God wants us. He wants us. He says, guys, this is time for a party. We're going to be sitting together. I'm going to see you. We're going to be sitting at this table together. Let's celebrate. Let's bring out the wine. Let's bring out the meat. Wear your finest clothes. It's a celebration. This is God's birthday, so to speak. God doesn't have a birthday. But you know what God does have? What's the day of God's coronation as a God? When he had subjects. Who was the first subject? Adam and Eve. What day were they created on? On Rosh Hashanah. This is the day that God celebrates creation. This is the day that God says, Wow! This world that I created, and you've helped, and you've helped, and every one of us, we've helped in making this world a better place. Because if God didn't think we can assist in making this world a better place, he wouldn't keep us here. But he thought there was something we could contribute. See, he keeps us here. When we talk about shofar, it's interesting that the shofar starts at a very narrow place and ends at a wide place. Because we start... Small steps. Small steps. But it becomes something which is very great. We also sometimes think, me, who am I? What can I do? You can become great too. There's a lot of history to the reason we have shofar. The reason the Torah, the Torah tells us, Abraham, when he brought Isaac as, a, as an offering, and he was about to slaughter him, the angel stops him and says, no, no, no. Instead, slaughter the ram. And that's why we use a shofar specifically for Maram and the ram. I don't want to get into too much of the details, but the bottom line is that we take the ram's horn, which it was entangled in the bushes, and we use that ram to awaken us. That's the shofar we blow, to wake up. The whole connection to the purpose of why we're here. But it's important for us to have focus. Very important. There's a story that's told... I for sure shared this. I don't know if I shared this in this forum, in this class. But there was a man who had heard that there's a faraway island that has unbelievably precious gems, diamonds all over the place. You can go and you can scoop up diamonds. You're the richest man on earth. So he tells his wife, listen, I've been struggling in, in our livelihood for a long time. Maybe it's worth it for me to go on this trip Long journey. I'll go and I'll get the diamonds. I'll come back and we'll have so much wealth. She's like, yeah, but you heard that it takes three years to get there. And then you have to wait three years till you can get the trip, the going, going back. Right? It's going to be a nine year ordeal. Says, but you know what? It's been so difficult. Can't get worse. Just go. Hopefully we'll live a great life after that point. Fine. Gets on the boat, he buys the ticket, and it's a long boat ride. And indeed, it takes three years, and everyone's talking about all the riches that they're going to earn there and all of the diamonds that they're going to accumulate. He brings, of course, two empty duffel bags, two big duffel bags, the oversized ones, you know, the one that's like, I'm going golfing, right? So he brings the extra long ones, the ski, the ski, the big ones. And he's going to bring back all of those diamonds. Finally gets there and they're looking and they're like, wow, it really is. It's sparkling. This island is sparkling from the diamonds. It's incredible. They get there. They get off the boat. And he starts shoveling in the diamonds into his bag, shoveling in the diamonds. And he's ready to go back. But he's got to wait now until the next boat goes back. So he sees a hotel. Checks into the hotel. And they say, okay, how long are you going to be staying here for? He says, three years. Like, oh, terrific, wonderful, welcome. How are you going to pay for this? He says, I've got some diamonds. I've got some... They're like, no, 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 everyone's got diamonds here. You got you to have a different currency here. 
So I was like, what's the currency? The currency here is coconuts. Oh, coconuts. What do I do? I go get a job. Go to bag some groceries and then they'll pay you in coconuts. You'll open up a, a coconut account and, and then you'll pay us in coconuts. Beautiful. Amazing. So he, uh, he goes, he gets a job. They check him in. He looks like a, ne- a decent person. They're going to give him credit. He starts bagging groceries and he gets coconuts and he pays his, his rent. And they see he's a great, a very qualified uh, worker. So they advance him to cashier. Eventually he becomes the store manager. Then he becomes the regional manager. This guy is really doing well and his coconut account is really solid. Okay. And he is a wealthy guy. You know, he's doing really well. Sure enough, it's now a half a year in and he's, he's doing very well. He's getting promotion after promotion after promotion. And it's really incredible. It's, 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 he can't, he can't believe how well he's been doing. Of course, he's thinking about his family and how he's gonna, you know, he's gonna impress them by how well he's done. And, you know, after first year, after 18 months, after two years, finally he's starting to get ready to go back and packs his bags and he gets back on the boat after three years. It's a long journey home. Finally, he's, Three years into the trip, and he sees he sees his family, the little kids he left. Now they're big kids, and they're all excited, jumping for joy. Our father's here. Our father's here. He gets there. Finally, gets to the dock. And he gets off the boat, and he's hugging and kissing them. And he says, "Guys, you won't believe it. You won't even believe how amazing this island was." And he goes to the house. He opens up the bags. And the coconuts are flying all over the place. He has coconuts everywhere. And they're like, what's this? He says, what do you mean? Coconuts is the currency. That's what it is. Coconuts. Everybody knows coconuts are the currency. And with total devastation. You know, we come to this world. Hashem tells us, I want you to get as many mitzvahs as possible. As many mitzvahs as you can. And people come here and they tell them, the currency here is not mitzvahs. The currency here is dollars. What's wrong with you? Right? It's all dollars. And one year after another year after another year, we have, you know, constantly being indoctrinated with this idea. It's all about money and who are the people they glorify. Not the people who do the acts of kindness. That they'll do at the end of the show, the last 30 seconds, hero of the week. That's it. Everything else is about people who make money and all about the companies and they'll have business channels. It's all about money. When really it's all about the gems. What are those real gems? The mitzvahs that we perform. Imagine the devastation for that soul. When a baby comes to this world, it comes crying. You know, why does it come crying? It doesn't want to be here. I was in a world without distractions. I was in a world where it says that the fetus can see from one end of the world to the other. You know what that means? It can see from one end of the world to the other. That means there's no physical barriers. There's no trappings. There's no blockades. There's nothing. Absolute clarity. I know exactly, with a clear vision, exactly my purpose. I know it all. I got it all. Clear vision. Come into this world. Baby's like, why did you bring me here? I don't want to be here. Oh, so we're going to bring balloons and we're going to bring a little doll or a truck. Or... Tell the child, it's okay. We're going to give you a toy and we're going to give you a tablet and we're going to give you things to distract you. Ch- child is really craving and desiring what I'm here for. I'm here for those diamonds, for those jewels, for those mitzvahs. Anybody ever do a mitzvah and feel good? It feels so good. When you do something to help somebody else, you go out of your way. What, what's that feeling? What's that feeling, that, that sensation that we feel? That's the feeling of like, ah, I'm fulfilling my purpose. That's what we're here for. We're here for those gems that we pick up by every mitzvah. You can get that, by the way, by learning Torah. I feel that when we finish these classes, when I finish learning Torah, I feel like I'm walking on the clouds. I love it. Ah, Hashem, this, that's what you put me here for. You put me here to serve you. Every mitzvah that we do is one of those gems. God says, that's what I want you to collect. We have opportunities for mitzvahs day and night. But do people run after doing mitzvahs all day? 
Or perhaps do we get sidetracked? And we all get sidetracked, which is normal. Which is why we have a tremendous gift called Rosh Hashanah, where we recalibrate, we realign ourselves. You know what happens when you drive your car and you hit a curb, and now your steering wheel is not exactly straight? You need to realign it. Rosh Hashanah is a time to realign. It's a time to recalibrate, reset. That is the gift of Rosh Hashanah. It's a time to really break through all barriers. There's no limitations. Like you blow that chauffeur and it puts a shudder in your spine. That's what we do on Rosh Hashanah. We break all the barriers. Our job on Rosh Hashanah is to stay focused on why we're here. It's interesting that Sephardic custom is to say slichot for the full 30 days leading up to Rosh Hashanah and then the 10 days following till Yom Kippur. Why? Because they say that in order to achieve perfect atonement, we need to do what was done back in the desert. And the Jewish people, before they received the second tablets, they needed 40 days of focus. And they blew the show for every day to keep people in the focus. The Ashkenazic do only a minimum of four days. Minimum of four days of slichot, of um, supplications, asking forgiveness. Why only four days? Because an animal needs to be observed for four days before you can slaughter it to make sure there are no blemishes. It doesn't have a broken leg. It doesn't have, you know, you see, you can see the blemishes when it's been hanging around. You can see. So we do four days. The Ashkenazic do four days of these, uh, these uh, slichot, of these special prayers to show that we're, we're kosher, we're kosher people. Okay. We're good people. And we try to ex- exemplify that. Teshuva, repentance, it says that these 10 days from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur is 10 days of repentance. Aseret Yemei Teshuva. 10 days of repentance. First day is the first day of Rosh Hashanah. How do we exemplify that repentance? Being happy. Being happy. I'll tell you an amazing thing. My grandfather, and we're going to talk about this more. When we talk about Yom Kippur, we'll talk more about about what it means to repent. We'll talk about forgiveness. We'll talk about the importance of Yom Kippur. But I want to share with you one incredible story. My grandfather, when he was in the Mir Yeshiva in Poland, it's like Yom Kippur was a serious day. It's like, wow. And they're about to start Musaf, the afternoon prayer. It's like the pinnacle of Yom Kippur. And someone walks over to my grandfather and he says, where is so-and-so? She says, oh, I heard that so-and-so is, uh, is not well. He's in bed. He said, did you go visit him? He says, now? Like, like right now? Like we're, we're about to start the Yom Kippur service of Musaf, like the, 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 the highlight of Yom Kippur, and now I should go visit him? So he said to my grandfather, it's mitzvah hayom. It's the mitzvah of the day. It's the mitzvah of the day. So my grandfather didn't know what to do. So he slips out of synagogue and he goes to visit the sick friend of his. And he sees who's standing by his bedside. The great rabbi, the head of the yeshiva is there. All of the righteous, the leaders, the leaders, the top notch, the top brass are all there at his bedside, caring for him visiting him, encouraging him, taking care of him. And my grandfather was blown away by that. He said, the mitzvah is not to live in your own world. The mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is to be awesome, is to be great, is to go beyond yourself, beyond what you thought you can be, you're capable of. Break all those barriers. That's what Rosh Hashanah is about. It's the new me. You know, they have when they do these uh, fashion, it's the new me, you're going to wear a new suit, and you're going to wear a new dress, and it's the new me. That's what Rosh Hashanah is, and that's what Yom Kippur is. It's the time where we demonstrate the new me. My dear friends, utilize these days. They're so amazing. The greatest gift God gave us is Rosh Hashanah. We start a new leaf. 
New page. God doesn't ask about the past, by the way. Cop stops you. You say, please, give me a chance. Give me one chance and I'll prove to you that. He goes back to his car. He says, just a second. He says, you have 30 tickets here. <laughs> 30 tickets. 30. Hey, you want me to give you a new chance? Hashem says yes, because I know what you're capable of. Don't forget, Hashem is our creator. Hashem invested the resources that are in us. Hashem gave us the potential. Hashem wants us to succeed. He wants us to enjoy these days. So let's go and enjoy them. Let's maximize these days. Let's get the most out of these days so that when we're done with Rosh Hashanah, we can't wait for Yom Kippur. We're like, Hashem, I'm a new person. I'm not the same guy. I'm a different person. Look at how, how I've changed. And if there's only one thing, one, one thing that we can change, I'm not going to give any suggestions or ideas. Each one of us have to think of one thing, something. Something, whatever it is. It, it can be something as simple as, I'm going to say Shema every day. Imagine, just one simple Shema. Before I go to sleep, I'm going to say the Shema. Or like we mentioned earlier, a blessing. Something, something I'm going to add, I'm going to change in my life. So that when we come on Yom Kippur and God says, you're telling me you're a different person, in what way? Here, look, here's the past 10 days. I've been perfect. Every day I made that change. We think, we may think, well, it needs to be something significant. No. Something microcosmically small. Something so small. Our sages tell us Rosh Hashanah is a microcosm of the future year. You know what that means? That means that every minute of the year is perhaps a day or three days during the year. So if you can take Rosh Hashanah and use it as a time to learn, use it as a time to be happy, speak good things, to say these these signs that we spoke about in a positive, bring positivity into your into your table, at your Shabbos table, at your Yom Tov table, your holiday festival. Positivity, have good things. We're bringing unbelievable blessing into our Rosh Hashanah, unbelievable blessing into our year. Hashem should bless us all. And by the way, this is something you could pray for. If you don't know what to do, pray for it. Hashem, I don't know what to do. Tell me. I want to change. I want to do something. Hashem, help me. You can ask Hashem for anything. If any of my children were to ever say, Abba, I want to ask you something, but I don't know what to ask for. Right? That would be a very good request. Help me. Help me find something. Something. Hashem wants the relationship with us. Hashem wants the relationship with us more than we can possibly imagine. Because he's our investor. He wants us to produce. He wants us to do good. So let's, let's make God happy. Have an amazing Rosh Hashanah. Have a Shana Tova, Umetuka, a sweet, beautiful New Year. And God should bless us. This coming year should be the most magnificent, amazing year we've ever had. Amen. Amen. Right, so, so our sages tell us that the answer is yes, that when you speak things out, the commitment is much greater. I'll give you an example. What's the difference between someone who says to themselves without words, I'm going to go on a diet, versus someone who declares, I'm going to go on a diet? We have a stronger commitment to our words. It brings it to life. So it doesn't have to be in front of people. It could be alone in a room. It could be out in the field. It could be in your car. Hashem hears us wherever we are. But for ourselves, there's a stronger uh, power to things when we speak them out. And when we say, I want to make a commitment, and our sages say to do this, speak it out with words, with words. And you know what? Hopefully that ability that we have to say it out, to talk it out, will help us you know, strengthen and, and, and be able to attain it. It's not something which is extremely common, but again, it's, it's people trying to make an emphasis of change. 
So if it's if, if you feel that you know for one hour, I'm just gonna keep to myself and stay focused and try not you know try not to talk and, and just do idle chatter. I think that could be helpful at times. But again, we're not here trying to be extremists and crazy people like uh 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 right? not talking right. It's, that's correct. That's very important. The Chavetz Chaim talks about the importance of of proper speech. But also, look, there's a special power of anything good that we do. Studying Torah, studying Torah on the day of, of Rosh Hashanah has unbelievable power because we're infusing our consciousness with Torah, with with connection to Hashem. We spoke about at the beginning of class. We spoke about the the signs, the different s- symbolisms that we do. Right. That's also we're adding good things into our day. So if someone brings to you, brings you a story of like, did you hear about you know that guy? Did you hear that he's like he's you know he has trial now and he's you know being uh, accused of uh, I, I, not on Rosh Hashanah. I don't want to hear about it. Anyway. But right after Rosh Hashanah, I'll be calling you for details. No, no, no. No, but the, the idea is we want to, we want to stay, we want to stay. Oh, yeah. And you, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So during, during a speech fast, you can learn. During a speech fast, you can say blessings. During, during, you, it's not, it's, it's a self-imposed restriction that people, uh, have just to keep them on, on, on focus. All right. My dear friends, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a magnificent new year, everybody, please. And if you can, I need all the help I can get, so please pray for me too. Thank you, thank you. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcasts.com.